All right. I think we can get going. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to those in other time zones. Um, my name is Allison Hamilton, and I am your co host with Chen Ching Lang uh, of this Implementation Science Beachside Chat, sponsored by the UCLA Rapid Rigorous Relevant Implementation. Asian Science Hub. Thank you all so much for joining. And if any of you are new to the Beachside Chat series, welcome and thank you so much for making this your first and for returning folks, thanks for coming back. These have been a lot of fun and I always look forward to them. Oh, yay, now I can see you, Matt. Um, and I am uh, very excited about today's chat with one of my dear colleagues and friends, Matt Tinman. Uh, but first, Chen Ching, do you wanna say hello? Hi, um, my name is Chun Ching Ling. Um, I, I'm a, currently an assistant professor in resident um, at UCLA Department of Psychiatry and um, Biobehavioral Sciences. Um, I'm also a UCLA 3R Hub, uh, 3R Hub uh, investigator. So um, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Chen Ching. Uh, so just in case you haven't been to a chat, uh, just to give you a little feel for the format before I um, introduce Matt, this is meant to be an informal discussion. We have some discussion questions in mind, but we're also very interested in your questions. So there's no formal presentation. Um, we're just gonna do some introductions and then chat with Matt, which is perfect. Um, so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and Chen Ching is gonna monitor that. You can also put them in the Q&A if that's more comfortable for you. We should catch them in both places and we'll kind of go back and forth between asking um, and addressing your questions and comments and, and uh, other things that Matt and I were thinking about chatting about, uh, but it's very open, very informal and, um, uh, you know, really just meant to be a dialogue. Um, and I, hopefully folks are muted, I believe. I'm not hearing any ground sound. Is everything sounding okay to you, Elena and Chen Ching? Okay, and we are recording just uh, just for your information for folks who weren't able to join today but wanted to hear it later. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide, Chen Ching. Oh. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so it is my very great pleasure to introduce to all of you Dr. Matt Tinman, who's gonna be talking with us today about community-based implementation science, what to do when they have no computers. Um, I've had the great fortune of knowing Matt for almost 20 years. Uh, we did quite a bit of implementation research together, very early implementation research together back in the day when Matt was still in uh, Los Angeles. We very much miss him to this day. Um, and he has just done absolutely incredible things in the field of implementation science. And I'm so thrilled that he is a consultant for our implementation hub and one of our guests for these beachside chats. Uh, so I could talk for the entire hour about Matt and how amazing I think he is, but that's not what we're here for. Um, oh my God, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> so now Matt is uh, in Pittsburgh at the Vision for Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, or MIREC, which are um, centers around the country that each address different aspects and facets of mental illness. And he's also at the Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion and the director of the Implementation Corps at the VA in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's also been with RAND a long time, a senior behavioral scientist with RAND, and has an appointment at the University of Pittsburgh as a senior implementation scientist at the Pitt Dissemination Implementation Science Collaborative. And that is probably just a few of the affiliations that Matt has. But Matt, welcome, and thank you so, so much for being here today. Um, I'll try to uh, keep my camera on, but I my internet's like going back and forth. Okay. No problem. We love to see you, but it's great to hear you if that's what we have. Um, so before we get started with Matt, we're just gonna do a quick poll just to know who's with us in the audience. Most of you are used to this by now. Um, so we'll turn it over to Elena. And Chen Chen. Yeah. 
So would you say your primary work in academia, government, or non-profit, uh, non-profit or industry or others? Please, so. Um, we will pause. Okay, so today we have 60% uh, of the participants from academia and 30% from government, 10% nonprofit. Perfect. So we only have one um, poll question today. Yep. I will stop sharing and um, let Dr. Chinman talk about um, his excellent work. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. So I think, Matt, it would be really helpful for us. My questions are on my second screen. That's why I'm looking up. Um, it would be great for us if you could just really briefly describe the lay of the land of the work that you're doing these days. I think you're still doing a mix of community-based implementation, VA-based implementation. So can you describe for us what you're working on and where you're working on it, what kinds of um, topics you're addressing in your research? Sure. Um, so thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always great to hang out with Allison and <laughs> Um So I've been uh, traditionally doing a lot of community-based work. So I did a number of projects in community-based agencies. Um, so mainly things like boys and girls clubs. I don't know if folks have ever been to a boys and girls club, but they are sort of the, you know, they don't have a lot of resources. Some of them don't have computers. Um, so uh, that's been some of the work. Um, we have now, we, we have an uh, NIH grant where we're gonna be trying to go get into schools to do some implementation work, which has been a little bit crazy making with, with uh, COVID and everything, but um, that's gonna be uh, a big area for us coming up. Uh, and then a lot of work, uh, so I also work in the VA, so, um, you know, that's like more traditional, you know, hospital clinic based, based stuff um, and, you know, things that folks may be more, maybe a little bit more familiar with, um, you know, more of a medical setting. And then um, in the last few years, we've been doing a, really a lot of implementation work in the military, which mm -hmm. is really uh, fascinating, interesting, um, just, uh, you know, implementation is still a big deal there. I mean, like my initial thought was like, oh, you know, you can just get the top people to order, you know, the people below them to do everything. And it's just not quite that way. Does it work like that? <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, one of the Eric strategies, mandate change doesn't really, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so, a, you know, a wide variety of, of places, you know, each with different amount of resources, uh, different structures, um, uh, the formality of a lot of the of the hierarchy, you know, varies differently from like the military being very, you know, super formal to boys and girls clubs being, you know, kind of like the wild west where, you know, super flat and it's not really clear who's doing what kind of thing. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, a wide variety. You have seen it all, I would say, <laughs> or quite a bit of different settings and contexts. Um, for sure. I mean, and, and yeah. the, the, the military, the new, which is the newest for us is, um, that's just been really, um, it's just been really fascinating. Um, we've been working primarily to try to get uh, people to stop committing sexual assaults. Um, you may have heard about a lot of this in the news. Mm -hmm. um, We've been trying to put together reports for the Secretary of Defense, um, in addition to building capacity of individual installations like an Air Force base or an Army base to try to do better evidence-based approaches, basically. You know, um, there are some evidence-based approaches for sexual assault prevention, um, but you know, it's, a, it's the same story. They're just not doing them. You know, there's a uh, leader priority is not all together there. And so it's yeah, so I mean, even though the, a lot of these places do differ, they, you know, there's a lot of similarity implementation wise. Yeah, yeah. 
that's super interesting. I didn't even know you were doing that work. So I will try to restrain myself from asking you 100 questions mm. about that. But <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, you know, given that incredible range of experience across settings, contexts, um, structures, um, be really interesting to hear, you know, what, what you've observed about community-based implementation. I mean, I know for me, I grew up in implementation in the VA context and I didn't know how particular that was until I started doing community-based implementation outside of a, an integrated healthcare system. And it really blew my mind in so many ways um, and really kind of shook up everything I thought I knew about implementation. And I'm wondering, you know, if we can kind of get into the heart of the question in your title, like mm -hmm. what happens with community-based implementation? What happens when they don't have computers and they don't have other resources when they have competing demands, et cetera? What have you, what have you been observing yeah. about community-based implementation? Um, so I, I think a few things, I mean, one, like, so especially like the Boys and Girls Clubs thing, you know, you really have to be working on something that they want. I mean, you know, like in the VA, I you know, it's still hard, um, but there's a little bit more appetite and tolerance for people just to do it because maybe they theoretically know it's the right thing, even though it doesn't like directly benefit them. But um, in these com in these small community-based agencies, if you are not directly helping them, they have no time for you. I mean, which is probably true in a lot, I mean, a lot of places, but it just seemed like even more so there. Um, yeah. Also, you have to meet them where they're at. I, you know, if they don't have computers, then you, um, you know, a lot of times uh, the most, com you know, for the work that we were doing the projects, like the most powerful computing device in the building was, was everybody's cell phone. Like, you know, and so I'm like, you can download an app and like, you know, do some basic uh, pre-post tests or whatever, or calc you know, just calculate an average and like compare that. I mean, it doesn't have to be super fancy, um, but like something that will allow them to, you know, take a critical look at what they're doing, see, you know, evaluate it, seeing if it works. And that's a big part of the getting to outcomes work that in the GTO that we do a lot of um, mm -hmm. is build capacity for planning for a lot of evaluation stuff, quality improvement. And so, you know, evaluation is pretty important. So they, we need to be able to try to get them to somehow evaluate. And so, yeah, and so some of our, some of our manuals literally have instructions on how to calculate an average, um, you know, very, very basic stuff, but better than just sort of, uh, you know, doing it, you know, what you thought just in the moment. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think that's sort of meeting them where they're at is like really the only thing that they can do. Right, right. Um, I should mention for the audience, if you're not familiar with Matt's amazing work, I would definitely recommend getting familiar with it. Um, but it is important to note that Matt was really central to the development of the ERIC implementation strategies and has just a tremendous amount of expertise in strategies. So for anyone in the audience who's thinking about strategy related questions, Matt is a great person to ask. I mean, I think even if we could talk a little bit more about the strategy that you've developed and, you know, really trademarked and spread in so many different systems, getting to outcomes. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about that and how that's sure. working. I mean, one aspect I was thinking about was the stakeholder engagement piece, which you just touched on a little bit of, you know, how do you get people to engage in these types of things to begin with? So yeah, I would love to hear about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> So getting to outcomes or DTO, as we call, as we often call it, um, you know, it, it sort of, it was born out of our, my early experience from grad school where we were evaluating uh, drug prevention coalitions. So like different sectors of the community coming together to prevent uh, uh, youth drug use. And they had a lot of money, a lot of, um, a lot of time. It was a very unusual the well-funded effort and it got zero outcomes by the end. And what we were realizing as we were evaluating this, we were sort of on the front lines of just watching this like slow motion 
train wreck and try to, you know, provide um, guidance to them. Um, but the guidance, you know, was a little bit like too late, too little too late. Uh, and so we felt like we needed to kind of put together all this guidance that we were kind of thinking about uh, in a more systematic way and, and provide that to folks. So we wrote all these manuals, but then quickly realized that, you know, no one learns to drive a car by reading about it in a book. And so we came up with, you know, tech, like we call it uh, technical assistance. Uh, other people would call it facilitation, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so we basically do a lot of the stuff that many of you know about in facilitation. Um, you know, basically walk people through a series of steps that GTO outlines, none of which we actually created, you know, but a lot of, you know, planning, evaluation, quality improvement. Each of those steps has certain tools or worksheets that kind of prompt you to take certain actions, make certain decisions, and then record them. Um, and they, and the tools also become the nexus point by which you interact with your, what we call TA providers, um, because they are like sort of the crystallization of all your thinking. Uh, and so then we constantly give people feedback in a very iterative way. Um, and then we like to get people through what we call like two cycles, which is you, you plan your program or your intervention, you uh, stand it up, you run it, you evaluate it, you improve it, and then you do the whole thing again. Um, and a lot of this comes out of, you know, community-based work where programs were more the norm as opposed to like medical services, which just, you know, go on for, you know, out of a clinic, the services just go on forever. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's sort of the basic setup. And then we've anchor a lot of these guides in all different kinds of content uh, areas, you know, from teen pregnancy, drug abuse, homelessness, uh, emergency preparedness, sexual assault prevention. Um, so we try to make sure that, uh, you know, when people are getting into the work, that they see themselves in the, in the stuff that the measures we're talking about for evaluation are measures that are key to the area. The evidence-based practices that we would say to think about are the ones that are known to be evidence-based practices in that area. Um, so that's a you know that's a, sort of the staples, like the key uh, parts of that. And then yeah, so uh, we usually start out by uh, engaging people around, like you know what kind of problems they want to tackle and then guide them to evidence-based approaches that would help them guide their work. Um, and it's all like, it's by, it's collaborative sort of by design. Like we can't, you can't do GTO. It's like a two-legged stool. Like you need, it would just collapse without collaboration. You need an active partnership. Um, and so we, we like to try to run them through those steps and get them to do the tools but it's all on their own work. That's all on their own stuff that they, that's important for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so like when we got into the military work, it was really challenging because, you know, I mean, the bases that we were working with and in one project, we were working with every Air Force base in the world, like over <laughs> um, some overseas. Um, and they had like, like such a myriad uh, of problems. It was, you know, we had to kind of try to be all things to all people. It was really difficult to, uh, you know, be able to speak expertly on all these different topics, you know, um, from stress to suicide, sleep problem. I mean, it, just like all sorts of, um, so that was challenging. Um, but usually we get sort of the buy-in because people are excited to have help on things that they want to work on. Um, Sometimes for research purposes, we might go to places and say, hey, would you be interested in doing X? Um, and so that, that's kind of helpful, like in the NIH world where, you know, you have to write a grant and you, the grant application can't quite say, well, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> Give us uh, $3 million. So you sometimes you have to balance, um, how much uh, you know predetermined uh, programs that you're going to work on uh, when you're doing sort of more NIH research versus like the military where it's really wide open, uh, you know whatever they want to do, we we support them in that. Mm -hmm. And have you found um, 
I have two questions. Super interesting. Have you found that GTO as, as you know, I, I think of it as sort of a bundle of strategies, sounds super similar to like evidence-based quality improvement um, in some ways. Um, have you found that it has pretty much kind of stayed the same uh, across all these different contexts and types of projects? Like, have you made adjustments to GTO over the years or does it kind of play out differently in different contexts and with different types of implementation efforts? Or is it, have you found it to be a little bit more sort of constant in its, in its formulation? So I think um, the, it has changed some over the years. I mean, our overriding goal from the beginning till now is to try to shrink it to its smallest possible burden size or size burden. Mm -hmm. um, because when we first started, we had, you know, super expert people, PhD level people spending gobs and gobs of time. And it was just, um, it, it was just not, I think, uh, sustainable or real world with the amount of systems. And so we've tried to over years, very slowly shrink the manuals, shrink the tools, shrink the assistance to try to get to the minimum amount that we could still get uh, impact. And the two NIH trials were uh, helpful. So we had like more like masters level people um, with sort of every other week contact with certain spikes at certain times. Um, and like the tools were slightly thin, you know, thinned. Um, and we actually did uh, two different cost effectiveness or cost impact studies and found that, you know, it, for say preventing like one pregnancy or getting a few kids to not use drugs would just totally pay for all the assistance, uh, you know, that we were giving. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we think we've, we're getting close, I think, to the, that minimum amount. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I do think that, uh, you know, we, like a lot of implementation folks, you know, we, you know, we track, like when we're doing a project, we count up and track all the delivery of, you know, the coaching or technical assistance. And so, um, you know, I think it sort of behooves us to come up with something that's a little, you know, that would be feasible, say, for like the federal government to, to do in a program or, you know, some large foundation or the VA or, because otherwise we'll be a little bit, you know, as guilty as some of the evidence-based practices that we try to foster in which like, you know, they, they look great in the efficacy trials because of all the support and bells and whistles. But then when you try to go do them in the real world, they're like impossible to do. So, you know, I think implementation support uh, is, can fall into that same trap too. So I think yeah. you be cognizant of that. Yeah, I have the same question about like stakeholder engagement because um, to my understanding, some stakeholder may not even realize there is a like health problem that needs to be tackled in their in their setting, right? And then um, uh, that and also the second that uh, is that stakeholder may not realize the the value of uh, get to outcome uh, approaches. Um, uh, versus the um, personnel, uh, like the, the personnel costs and then uh, financial costs of uh, for performing this uh, get to uh, outcome activities. So um, would you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, there is, um, there's no magic answer there. I mean, I usually, we just try to tell people about, um, you know, here's what we offer. You know, it. Uh, I think um, we try to be very honest about that. It does take. You know, you, you can't get benefit without doing any work. You know, uh, people kind. You know, they they want things that are streamlined and streamlined. Uh oh, um, can, you, can you guys still hear me? Oh, yep. Okay. Oh, you, you blinked out there for a second. So people keep wanting things that are streamlined and streamlined and streamlined. And we, we, we are trying to do that where we actually have two different 
efforts now where we we're taking sort of our big manual and we're going to like shrink it to like 12 pages. Um, but at some point, somebody ha at a site has to do something. And so, uh, you know, we're just upfront about that. It will take, a, you know, a little bit of time if, uh, but we have lots of evidence to show that um, if you do invest some time, you will get benefit in terms of better implementation and better outcomes. And, you know, if you're interested, then, you know, we can help you do that. And we can, you know, again, we can provide tons of support, um, but people do have to show up. And it, that, that is a problem. And we, we actually, in one project, we looked at um, sort of, we assess what uh, the capacity, so like kind of quantify capacity and then we did that at the beginning and later on and uh, across all these different sites and then what we found was that you know sites that had a little bit higher capacity were at the start were actually able to um, uptake uh, more of the getting to outcomes and build their capacity more than sites that were like totally had no capacity or no interest. So it's like you have to have, I think, a little bit of interest in the capacity to build further capacity. Um, so yeah, it's definitely true that some sites might not be uh, ready for getting to outcomes um, or uh, any other implementation uh, you know, support. Have you, I just realized that I don't know if you have looked at sustainability of GTO. So have you like gone back to places where you, you know, did it years ago and are they still using it or pieces of it? Or do you have any sense of whether it sort of becomes institutionalized uh, to use that language? <laughs> yeah, um, so we have looked at that in certain studies and there's definitely a, you know, there's definitely a drop off uh, in terms of all the activities. Um, you know, one thing that we found is uh, in one study, we actually, so we looked at the sustainability of OPTO and the actual, the evidence-based program that we were using GTO to facilitate. Um, and sites that were, you know, compared to sites that didn't get GTO, but were asked to run that program anyway. Um, you know, the sites that got GTO, even after we stopped delivering the technical assistance, definitely we're doing the program more uh, and more readily than, than sites that didn't get GTO. Mm -hmm. And then GTO itself, um, yeah, there's, there, you know, there was definitely a degradation of, of all the activities. They weren't following it, um, you know, sort of like with tools, like in so a rigid fashion, but they were still sort of doing the basic approach in terms of, you know, setting some goals, plan, running it, evaluating it, you know, trying to improve it over time. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. Um, so uh, I have a question. So uh, regarding uh, GTO, uh, you describe uh, like some steps to go through um, from uh, needs assessment to goal setting to planning, evaluation, all that. So talking about streamlining, uh, do you recommend like some step that's uh, was absolutely essential that cannot be reduced and some like are more like optional. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like, it's like picking amongst your children. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what, actually in the streamlining, what we've tried to do is really catch things and like every put things together. So, I mean, the steps in a little, in a, in a in certain respects, are a little bit artificially constructed. In that, um, in reality, it's a little bit more fluid. And so, um, so one thing that we tell people that they should consider is like a, a, a question of fit. And so, um, like, so if you're going to do a certain kind of program or service. You know, how is that going to fit within your place, both like philosophically and logistically? Um, and, you know, having it as a separate step and like there's a whole fit assessment and all that, um, you know, in reality, I think people very quickly, I think, know whether it's going to be a good fit or not. And are, you know, like if you're thinking about all these different possible evidence based approaches, 
you can immediately start like kicking out and throwing out programs and, and services because like, you know, like you don't have the PhD level uh, therapist that you need for that. And so there's like, why even bother going down that road? So, um, so in reality, like it's more like things could be again, very quickly dispatched or uh, done um, rather than just sort of completely getting rid of something. Um, Cause a, a lot of the idea behind the steps and is to try to stop people from going down paths that we know will lead to ruin. <laughs> um, you know, like taking on a, a program that you have like no shot at implementing as design, you know, like we can figure that out ahead of time and then, you know, stop you from doing that. And so, uh, and save a lot of, you know, a lot of money, a lot of heartache. Um, so that's um, sort of a part of it. Um, but like, yeah, so I think um, it's hard to, you know, so uh, like, like capacity is another one. Um, like we, we have a whole step around, like, do you have capacity to do it? Um, again, I think it's not a necessarily an issue of like doing a formal capacity assessment, which we do have guidance for that. Um, but it's more maybe about just like, like you could do it in a meeting, you know, like, can we do like sitting around a table, can we do this? And then, you know, it doesn't have to be so formal and you're like done with it. Um, you know, again, it's all a matter of degree. Maybe you don't get quite as much out of that, but it's, it's probably better than just, uh, you know, diving in to a swimming pool without knowing if it's filled or not, you know? Um, so I guess that'd be my answer to that. That's great. Um, I do want to make sure we get a little bit into your paper about um, using implementation science to increase the impact of health disparities research because there's that's an amazing paper, and I hope everyone on this uh, in this session either has read it or is uh, planning to read it. Um, but uh, well, before I go there, there is a great question from Elena, which is, um, we'll come back to your disparities paper, but Elena is just asking if um, you have some thoughts about where community-based implementation science is going in the future. And I had kind of a similar question about like, you know, where would you go with study designs, knowing what you know now about community-based implementation? So if you have your... Uh, your crystal ball out and can talk a little bit about what we need to think about in community-based implementation, that would be awesome. I mean, so I am maybe a little bit heretical in that I, I would love to see, um, or maybe not, this is maybe not so much where it's going as where I think it should go, but um, I think we need to like have massively large implementation trials, like with like hundreds and hundreds of sites. Mm -hmm. um, because in some ways, a lot of the community-based prevention stuff, and I am 100% guilty of this myself, it's, it's a little bit like we're, you know, we're play acting because the communities don't necessarily they're not like waiting around for, you know, an implementation scientist to scroll by and say, hey, you wanna work with this? Um, you know, they're applying for grants, um, trying to get, you know, a little bit of, bit of money here, a bit of money there. Um, and I think what we've tried to show is that you don't have to break, it doesn't have to break the bank to provide communities with just a little bit of support and a little bit of resources to get them to do evidence-based practices, but they do need some. And so mm -hmm. there was a great trial, uh, like the Niatex 200. I don't know if folks have heard of that. If you're in sort of the substance abuse treatment world, um, N-I-A-T-X, it was a 200 site trial um, wow. where they, uh, they were four uh, arms groups and they were each, I think, randomized to different, differing amounts of support. And this was like going back now, you know, before I think implementation science was like just getting off the ground. 
when this came out. Um, so I, I would love to see more trials like that because then you could really think about, okay, well, we've shown that we can do this. Now we can actually do it on a scale that would actually make a difference in mm -hmm. problems that were, um, oh, let me shut my door, hold on. <laughs> Um, so that's where I would like to have it uh, go. I mean, I do think that there is a lot of uh, emphasis on, you know, sort of co, you know, like CBPR kind of stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot, you know, super collaborative. Um, but I, but I worry that, you know, uh, forging the relationships that lead to the, you know, those completely collaborative kind of efforts take a ton of time. And a lot of folks probably on, on, you know, maybe on this call, maybe, I don't know, might not have the time to just hang out and talk about like, well, what do you need? How can we um, help you? Um, and so, you know, if we want to make an impact at scale, right? And I think that's, that's the holy grail to me is like, how can we do this at scale? Because only at scale do you actually um, really start to move the needle in, a, in any significant way. Um, you know, it's like I, so I was happy that we were able to show impacts in our studies um, around these, you know, certain topics. But like, to me, it's like, could we do this, you know, for the entire country? And I actually think we could. Um, mm -hmm. Like I would, I mean, you know, during the Trump administration, this is sort of a non, you know, it was like a non-starter, but like sort of like a national prevention service where, you know, every community had some sort of level of support. And we've done that in this country. It's called the agricultural extension system, right? Mm -hmm. Where we created this completely nationwide network to get people to do better farming practices. And it was a huge success. I mean, incredible, like greatly in, uh, improving farm yields and uh, farming practices. And, and some of our earliest uh, implementation theories like diffusion of innovations is, was built off of a lot of that work with, you know, sp uh, spread, you know, the idea of spreading different best practices. So I do think it's possible. I, I don't know if we'll ever get there or if there's the, Sort of the political slash monetary will to to do it, um, but I think that's where we should be headed. That's fantastic. Um, we do have a question. I think we did touch on it a bit, Katie. Katie asked if you can speak to um, how you can collaboratively get to outcomes using stakeholder engagement. Um, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about that, but we, we got into it a little bit, Katie, so you might be able to hear it on the recording if you wanna listen in, but if you have any other thoughts, Matt, in response yeah. to this question. So a big, part of, um, a big part of what we do, so, you know, all these organizations have at least some hierarchy, even, you know, the Boys and Girls Club had like a head person and then like everybody else. Um, and so a lot of times what we'll be doing is that the people that we're working the most directly with, We'll actually work with them to engage their leaders. And so helping them to come up with briefings, maybe we'll co-brief with, um, with them to their leaders, but kind of be with them in sort of advocating for their own stuff and uh, you know, sharing data back about how it all went. Um, we try to like put them forward, but prepare them to, to do that. So we, we will sort of get involved in as, as sort of as much or as little as we can to like to get that to happen. Um, we've gotten into this a lot in the military where, you know, it's all, it's all stakeholder engagement in terms of like, if you don't capture the attention of the commander, you know, you're sunk. Uh, so, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time kind of prepping, okay, like what would the admiral think about this, you know? Um, and so that's a part of the work too. That's super helpful. Um, and thanks for your question, Katie. Um, so just in the little bit of time we have left, I mean, there's so much to talk about with your 
implementation and disparity paper. Um, one of the things that was super interesting to me was uh, about how, you know, what we are able to fix and address relates strongly to um, what we measure and what we don't measure. So we may, you know, if we haven't measured something that's actually impacting implementation, then we're probably not gonna, uh, you know, make any changes related to that because we don't even know what happened with it. And I was thinking, you know, one of that key, one of those key points is really about taking more ecological factors into account in implementation. And I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts about the implications of that for measurement. Um, you know, we are often measuring so many things. Uh, you know, I think that suggestion for being more oriented toward the socio-ecological environment could really enhance what we do in implementation about disparities. Um, I was just wondering if you could, you know, speak a little bit to what you think the implications are for measurement and how how this might look. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so, you know, I the the center of uh, of innovation, the coin that I'm here that I'm here at Pittsburgh is a disparities shop, and so you know predated me by many years. And so um, I'm not really a disparities researcher, I should just say. Um, but I, as I was hanging out in this place, like seeing all this research and talking to them, um, it just really seemed like they, you know, there was a big focus on um, understanding the drivers, but their, their like conceptualization of the drivers were really narrow and uh, you know, focused on like patients and providers. And what I, you know, like the very short summary of that paper was basically that, you know, implementation science can, has a lot of measurement uh, ideas and tools that push for, you know, broader ecological levels where I think a lot of the barriers lie. And so the idea is that if, you know, your conceptualization of the problem is going to drive your conceptualization of the solution. So if you're only thinking that this is a problem with patients, then everything you do is patient education. And like, mm -hmm. and a lot of the disparity stuff, at least early on was patient education. And then they're like, well, maybe providers have a role in this too. <laughs> and so then it was all provider education. Um, and so, you know, and so like one of the things that just to like a simple example was sort of like, again, like leader priority, like something that is sort of bread and butter in implementation science, you know, wasn't really even being discussed in disparities land. Uh, and I think they're a little better with that now, um, but it was sort of, I, I mean, I think we just have an implementation science, a ton of things at the, you know, at the ready, like, uh, you know, like the organizational measures that we have, um, you know, the, the conceptualization of barriers and facilitators, like, uh, like CIFR has, you know, multiple different, all the different domains. Uh, it, it just, we, it's just, we think a lot more ecologically just naturally that I think wasn't really going on um, in uh, disparities thinking and disparities uh, research. So the idea was to try to um, kind of push uh, that field to incorporate those ideas. And then the, um, the schematic or the diagram in there, it's sort of like a decision tree, um, was just a, an attempt to bring in, again, bread and butter stuff for implementation science. It's like the hybrid designs um, and to like when to think about what kind of design per how much evidence you say you have uh, or how much you know about your disparity, um, because I think it was not altogether clear about what what kind of method you should use to tackle what kind of problem at what kind of stage you're at. So it was just sort of a mm -hmm. to to um, to help researchers, you know, think about that. And then uh, you know, also like uh, Eva Woodward um, has also taken some of that and like run with it and created her whole framework. Um, which is, I think, really, you know, super helpful. Um, so yeah, it's been interesting to think about. And so, 
you know, it, I try to ping pong a little bit between, you know, like quote, doing my work, which is like, you know, head down, do the studies versus think about some of these larger issues. And uh, mm -hmm. so, I mean, we're, we're putting the finishing touches now on a paper um, that's gonna be in a special issue all around uh, replication and open science. Oh, nice. And so I'm writing a paper where we're trying to think about, well, what does replication mean for implementation studies? And, you know, there are some differences and there are some, I think, greater complications. And this has come out of our GTO work where we basically did the same, pretty much the same study, but the underlying evidence-based program was completely different and the measures were completely different. And so we got some of the same results, but not altogether the same. And so, you know, how do you think about that? What does that mean? You know, um, the relationship between the evidence-based practice and the implementation strategies and the settings and anyway, so it might, that might be another helpful thing for people to think about. Can't wait, what journal is that coming out in? That's gonna be in prevention science. Fantastic. Um, I know we have one question, Roger, if you still have your question and you would like to ask it, we would love to hear it. Or you could put it in the chat if that's- easy. Long time listener, first time caller. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna share your question? <laughs> um. Ah, I had to unmute. Great. Uh, I wonder I if you could. I can't see the chat, okay. but so you. So you still uh, can't hear me? I can hear you. I think, can you hear Roger, Matt? I cannot. Well, why don't I give, give you guys the question and then you give it to Matt. Okay, um, I'm gonna relay the question to you momentarily, Matt. Great. So um, I'm involved with multiple on the ground healthcare practices. And one of the challenges is a lack of skill within the practice in knowing how to implement evidence. So they don't have a lot of the implementation evidence skills and training, and therefore the learning curve for them to get clear on all the issues that we take for granted um, is often quite lengthy and very frustrating for them. And I wondered if there was a comment about that. Mm -hmm. Great, great question. Thank you, Roger. Um, Matt, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I don't know why I can hear you, but not. Okay. I don't know. Um, Roger was asking about uh, observation in healthcare systems, and I hope I'm getting this right, Roger. Uh, noticing that uh, there is a lack of skill with um, in practice with how to implement evidence and that the learning curve is lengthy. Um, and so how do you address, you know, the skills? This is my interpretation of the question. <laughs> Hopefully it's consistent, but you know, how do you address that sort of lack of, of capacity or skill with these types of endeavors? That was a great summary. Thank you. Yeah, it, that's a <laughs> problem. I, I, I don't know if the, again, there's a magic answer there. I mean, you know, uh, we, you know, people have to be trained to do the thing that you want them to do. So if it's like, you know, motivational interviewing, then they, and you want them to do that, then they've got to be trained in motivational interviewing. Um, sometimes what happens is with getting to outcomes, we often talk about it as a sort of a, an unflattering uh, mirror and that we hold up um, to you and that it reveals a lot of gaps that are, you know, need to be addressed. And so sometimes it's not altogether clear, like before, you know, um, what's going on. And so when you go through the steps and you kind of clearly see, like, you know, doing any kind of capacity assessment would kind of reveal like, look, we're asking people to do something that they don't have training to do. Maybe that's why it's not working. <laughs> um, right. So when we, you know, look back on, you know, for a quality improvement check, um, we obviously look at data for many evaluations we've gotten going, but we also use the, each individual step in retrospect uh, as a, also as a data source. So 
like how was your planning? How, you know, what were your goals? Um, you know, was your needs assessment on point? And then also like, did it fit? And, you know, did you have capacity to do it? And just, and then we have some tools for that, but, you know, just simply asking those questions in like, as a way to look back um, can reveal areas in which, uh, the, you know, the program or the service was tripped up and caused mm -hmm. it to fail. Um, and so sometimes that can be revealed in a more obvious way than before, where maybe the lack of training was more hidden and people didn't want to admit it or things like that. And so um, we will often, again, similar to what I was saying before, we will often you know, help staff advocate for themselves or for their others around, look, you, you know, we've got to make a change here. Otherwise it's just going to continue to not work. Mm -hmm. um, so, so can I understand uh, like GTO as a evidence-based practice to promote evidence-based practice? Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, it's as evidence-based, I guess, as anything else. I mean, you know, we've done trials to, you know, compare uh, sites, you know, that are all, every, everyone's trying to do an evidence-based practice of the same kind, half get GTO, half don't, and then those that get GTO do better, get better outcomes. Um, but yes, I think the short answer, like the short way is it's an evidence-based practice to try to get evidence-based practices going. Um, it's an evidence-based, I'd say, implementation practice or, imp or bundle of implementation strategies, as uh, Allison was saying before. Um, so, I, I think that would be an apt way to say it. Great. Well, I could talk to you for the rest of the day, but I know we're coming up on the top of the hour. Um, Chen Ching, would you mind just bringing up the slides for us again? I think, uh, so here are just some references from the couple of papers we've talked about today and a few additional items and the BTO um, link which is also on the next slide uh so here's where you can get a just an absolute amazing amount of information about gto um which is fantastic um so i just want to thank you so much matt for talking with us today it really was such a great chat and uh, always love chatting with you, always will. Um, so thank you so much for making time for this um, in your busy schedule. Thank you everyone for attending uh, our next Beachside Chat. And there are many thanks being expressed in the, in the chat. Um, our next and final Beachside Chat of this series will be in May, May 27th with Russ Glasgow. We are equally looking forward to our time with Russ, so we hope you can come back and join us for that chat. Uh, topic to be disseminated soon. And as usual, we do uh, send out a very, very, very brief evaluation after our beachside chats, and we humbly request that you complete it so that we can keep learning um, how you're experiencing these chats and anything that we can improve upon in the future. If you have any questions, please feel free to read out to us. I wanna thank Elena for facilitating this. Thank you Chen Ching for co-hosting and thank you Matt for being here with us and sharing your wisdom and experience with us. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye folks, enjoy. Thanks so much. Thank you, bye. Thank you.